When I was 23 years old, I stood at our church pulpit and delivered the eulogy at the funeral of a man who was a dedicated husband, father, farmer, and friend. A man who was respected by his community and beloved by his family. That man was my dad, and my dad died by suicide. I remember the day of his funeral vividly. It was the second day of January, the beginning of a new year. It was bitterly cold, like the step outside and your breath is taken away type of cold. The type of cold that makes you not want to be anywhere else but in your home. The type of cold that could leave your hands and feet numb. And the cold perfectly described how I was feeling at the time. My dad's death took not only my breath, but a piece of my heart away. I really didn't want to leave the house that day, and certainly not for his funeral. And no matter what anyone said or did, I was numb. And I'm so thankful that I practiced his eulogy over and over again, because my eyes were so welled with tears that I couldn't even read the paper of words in front of me. Nothing could have prepared me to stand up in front of my family, our neighbors, and our friends, and use my words to beg them not to let the way my dad died, a result of debilitating depression and anxiety, diminish the legacy of caring and compassion he left behind. But that's what the stigma surrounding mental illnesses has done. It's made us uncomfortable. It's made mental illnesses hard to talk about. It's made us treat people differently who we've known our entire lives. The stigma has forced us to feel shame and guilt about an illness caused by chemical imbalances in the brain that are beyond our control. My dad was a farmer. He was a farmer for 53 years. He took over our family farm at the age of 14 because his dad died in a farming accident. My mom was a teacher and they were married for 37 years. This past June would have marked their 40th wedding anniversary. The farm that my family lived on and the house that my parents designed together was in our family for over 100 years. My parents adopted my three siblings and me, and they truly dedicated their whole lives to taking care of us. At a young age, I fell in love with basketball. My parents had previously been high school theater directors, so I didn't exactly fit the script, per se, that they were familiar with. My dad loved to read, and he went and bought books upon books on the game of basketball, from the standpoint of a player, coach, and ref. He was determined to be one of my fourth grade basketball coaches, and that he was. It's safe to say that regardless of the sport or organization I was part of growing up, my parents supported me, regardless of if I got first place or last. In high school, my house was the place that my teammates and I went to before every home game. My mom would cook an amazing meal, and my dad would lead the prayer. My dad's dedication towards learning the game of basketball was mirrored in his commitment to our farm, our church, our community, and all of those who encompassed it. He was a good man who had what most seemingly desire. A loving spouse and kids, a successful career, and the respect of those around him. And that same man, my dad, suffered from mental illnesses. And as a result, my mom suffered, my siblings suffered, and I suffered. Because when someone you love suffers, you suffer too. I remember the first time my family and I heard the words depression and anxiety. I didn't believe it. It just didn't make sense. I naively thought the circumstances of my dad's life didn't align with the profile of a depression or anxiety diagnosis. And it wasn't until my dad's first stay in a behavioral health facility that I truly realized how severely the trajectory of our life would be altered. And it was right on the cusp of harvest that he was admitted into the hospital for the first time. Our community slowly started to notice his absence, and we knew we'd have to rely on them for help if he wasn't out of the hospital in time. 
but it was hard. How are we supposed to explain this to everyone else when we didn't even understand it ourselves? We were met with curiosity, speculation, care, and concern. And this was back in 2013, back when the stigma was even more prevalent. Mental illnesses were often used in the same sentences as words and expressions such as crazy, the loony bin, and losing their mind. The stigma perpetuated our fear and encouraged our silence. But the longer my family and I were silent about what we were going through, the more questions people started asking. And it wasn't until three years later in 2016 that my family and I agreed to post a statement on my Facebook page about what we were going through. A sentence from the post read, it's so hard to admit because there's such a negative stigma surrounding mental illnesses and we don't want anyone to think less of the incredible, hardworking, and strong person that he is. And just like the day of my dad's funeral, there was a strong need to advocate out against the stigma. And we were initially worried that transparency would lead to isolation, but in reality, it did the opposite. The amount of unity I felt after that post was equally as reassuring as it was heartbreaking. For once, I didn't feel alone, yet having this in common with so many people meant that so many others were hurting. Another common reaction we were met with was, it was like you took our situation and put it into words. It wasn't uncommon for wives of farmers in our community to disclose that they too were worried about their husbands and their mental health. Farming is an incredibly rewarding career but it's also very isolating. Farmers spend much of their day alone, and not only are they alone, they're pouring their heart and their soul into their livestock and their crop, which success is heavily dependent on factors outside of the farmer's control. Farming is so much more than a career. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle that many farmers put their own self-worth into. And between 2013 and 2017, my dad was in and out of inpatient treatment three different times. Each time was either around planting season or harvest season. My dad struggled to make the big financial decisions, such as when to sell his grain, which led to my mom having to familiarize herself with an occupation that is, at its best, complex. But it never failed that the one thing my dad always knew how to do regardless of what his state of mind was, was to get in the tractor and be in the field. It was second nature to him. After his third stay in inpatient treatment, him and my mom made the difficult decision to move off the farm, sell our house, and rent out our land. I'll never forget the day of our farm sale. The heartbreak, the emotion, and the tremendous sense of loss that goes along with leaving the place you've known to be home for your entire life. That morning before the sale started, I asked my dad to help me with something he'd done for me many times before. And he completely snapped at me. He showed more emotion in that situation than I had seen him show in years. And looking back, I know he wasn't mad at me. His reaction was a result of deep internal pain that he failed to put into words. And my reaction to that situation was to simply go to another room to cry, for fear of showing my hurt would make things worse. A response that I'm sure many loved ones of an individual with a diagnosed mental illness can probably relate to. I'll never forget that day. There's a difference between living and existing, and it was as if that was the day that my dad stopped living. After our farm sale, my dad seemed fine, for lack of a better word. He wasn't doing exceedingly well, but he also wasn't in the severe depths of his depression. He would go through the motions of every day, and he spent lots of time reading. And then five months later, my dad was gone. The last day I saw my dad was Christmas Eve. 
the night before, I had gotten engaged to my now husband, Kyle. And I was so excited to run in the house and show him my ring and tell him that I was going to make him go wedding dress shopping with me because he helped me shop for all of my prom dresses before that. And that night was cold, too. I was in a hurry to get home. I worked bright and early the next morning at a psychiatric residential treatment center for youth. And as Kyle and I were packing our car, I didn't run in to give him a hug goodbye like I always would. I really, truly thought I was going to see him again. I waved goodbye to him that night just as I waved goodbye to him every morning as I took off for school growing up. Two days later, I was at work and I received a text from my mom. Call me now. All capital letters and an exclamation point. And I immediately knew that something was wrong. And her first words to me through tears were, I have some very bad news. Dad has died. And just like the first time my family and I heard the words depression and anxiety, I didn't believe it. How? How could this be my actual life? I often think of that day and how it affected so many people. I think about how hard it was for my mom to make that phone call to all four of her children. I think about the first responders who saw me run into my parents' house and hug my mom. I think about my coworkers that I had to tell that could have in no way been prepared for that situation. I think about the immense anxiety that loomed over me every time my mom called me after that for fear of something bad happening. I get mad, I get sad, I get depressed, and if there's one thing I've learned, it's that feelings, whether good or bad, are normal. And that what's not normal is ignoring our present situation because society tells us that being anything but happy is less than. And now your story won't look exactly like my story or my dad's story, but I'm sure there are pieces of it that many of you can relate to. How many of you answer good when someone says, hey, how are you, even though you're really struggling inside? How many of you place your self-worth into your work, whether it's your schoolwork or your career? How many of you have a diagnosed mental illness and wish so badly you could explain it to people because it might help them understand you better, but you don't because the stigma holds you back? How many of you have witnessed the suffering of someone you love and care about so much, but you feel helpless because nothing you say or do can make it better? And my point is, although our stories may be different in a sense, they are the same. Nobody lives a life of unhurt, but everyone does handle being hurt differently. Whether your self-care is counseling, working out, reading, writing, yoga, or sewing, we must first acknowledge what is hurting us in order to make progress. And you may not have a mental illness, but you do have mental health. And the sooner we stop the stigma from polarizing us, the sooner we will see empathy unite us. Mental illness is not a reason to judge someone. It's a reason to love someone. And now today, I am 26 years old, and I am standing in front of all of you, sharing the deepest pain that I've ever felt, because I believe strongly in the idea that we need to stop holding ourselves to the standard that we're mentally strong enough to handle all of life's challenges, and start acknowledging that feelings of vulnerability are okay. Thank you.